when I was in elementary school, growing up in Virginia, all of us neighborhood boys rode bikes. Anybody ride bikes as a kid? We went everywhere on our bikes. We rode them to the store to get baseball cards, right? You rode, rode them to the creek to swim, rode them to the ball field, rode them all over the place. We rode them through the woods. We rode everywhere. It was like the Goonies, right? And so I've always been short. And so I was the shortest in the crew, and I was the youngest as well. So I was the shortest by far. And so some of my friends, as they got taller, they started to get 10 speeds, right? Which means you could go faster with less effort. But I wasn't tall enough to ride a 10 speed. So I had to work harder to go as fast as everybody else. But the one thing that I could do that they could no longer do with 10 speeds is I could still make skid marks, <laughs> right? Anybody remember making skid marks? Yeah. So <clears throat> this was one of the coolest things about riding a bike was the ability to come to an abrupt stop and make a skid mark. And the longer that you made the skid mark, the better, right? We used to have competitions as to who could make the longest skid marks. Skid marks were a sign of skill, right? <clears throat> well, one day when I was in fourth grade, all my friends with their 10 speeds, you know, and little Mike S still has his one speed BMX bike, right? And they all decide to have a race. And I know that I'm the underdog because I'm the youngest one and I only have one speed. So we all line up on the starting line. And somebody had a cap gun. Anybody remember cap guns? Right? They point it in the air, and with a ready, set, go, the gun fires, and we all take off. And I give it everything I've got, my little legs just pedaling. I'm pedaling as fast as I can, and somehow, to this day, I'm not sure how. I think maybe they let me win. But I pull out ahead, and I win without a 10-speed. And it was glorious. It was wonderful. I won. And so to celebrate... To, as soon as I fast the finish line, I decide to do a huge skid mark, right? And show, so with a huge smile, I slam on my brakes, and my back tire slides around, and I end up sideways in the road. But what I didn't calculate is that I now had six or seven bikes speeding toward me. And so since none of them was expecting my celebratory skid, some of them literally ran over me, threw me from my bike, and all of them landed on top of me. And broke my arm. So there I was, the champ, the underdog who took it all. One moment I'm on cloud nine, and the next I'm flat on the ground with tangled up in bike tires and elbows with a broken arm. And so one, one moment I'm making the longest skid mark in history, and the next I'm on my way to the ER with my parents. And I had to wear a cast for months, and that summer I didn't get to swim. My family, that was the summer my, my parents went to the ocean, and I had to stay on the beach. It was awful. It was horrible. And what was worse was that I went from riding every day with all my friends to not being able to ride for, for, for months throughout the summer break. So I went from everything going my way, overcoming in the face of adversity, winning with a deck stacked against me, to trauma and pain. In a split, I went from victorious to incredible pain. And this experience, it's not, just, it's not just an experience that fourth grade Micah went through. I went through experiences throughout my life that were like that as well. Anybody else? You're riding high, and then bam, you hit a wall. Or in this case, all the walls hit me several times. But how many of us can relate to this, right? Maybe you've had a, times that were a swift transition from triumph to trial relationship success to pain. It, we've all been there. It's a universal experience. And sometimes when you're on the high, you're just like holding on, waiting for that to come, right? So often those turns, they leave us with trouble, hurt, even confusion. So today we're going to talk about how to find how to find comfort in the trouble that life throws our way. And this is why we're in this series. This is the second message in the series called Anchor, Finding Assurance in God's Promises. Because we believe that with everything that's going on, and look, everything that's going to go on in our lives, in our families, or even in our nation, this election year, by the way, I think it's going to be important that we remember who our anchor is. Right, Because when the, curl, the world constantly shift, shifting and changing and you, us never knowing what's around the corner, it can be really easy to feel like you're walking on sand. 
And for a lot of us right now, that's the way life feels. And we've all been through enough unexpected storms that we understand that even if everything's going well, sometimes we're subconsciously bracing ourselves for that huge crash that could be coming around the corner. And that's why we're doing this series is because we believe that all of us can use a little anchoring, right? Something solid to find assurance in. So last week, we talked about that in the midst of unpredictability and the chaos of life, that we got this hope as an anchor for our soul. We don't have to be afraid because it's firm and secure. And that hope comes through the resurrection of Jesus. Because, and this is the theme for this series, okay? That the storms of, in the storms of life, in the middle of the uncertainty, the unpredictability, Jesus is our anchor. He is the firm foundation that we can build our lives on. And he is the solid rock that will endure no matter what happens to us. And look, this may, uh, this may not be a surprise, but we all know sometimes life hurts. It can be full of harsh pain. We experience loss in this life. We experience grief. We experience pain. It is. And in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, we see how common it has been throughout history because Peter, he says, dear friends, thank you, I'm a friend, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, don't be surprised when trouble happens or pain as we walk through life. These pains are part of the human experience. They're inherent to the nature of life and the complexities of our emotions, our relationships. These pains, these, these hurts, they're, they're universal. They transcend cultures, historical periods. They're experienced by people all over the world in every culture, in every corner of the globe. But regardless of the reasons why, this fact remains that the consequence of, the, of decisions, it is real and it hurts. And we hurt, we look for ways to escape the pain a lot of times, but a lot of times what we all experience is that in times of trouble, sometimes it feels like there's no comfort. Because we see pain all around us, we see trouble all around us, right? In the face of the people of the street, our coworkers, our family, our friends, us. Even in the emptiness and shallowness of conversation, sometimes where you say, How are you? I'm fine, how are you? Just the shallowness of that sometimes, the defensiveness of people that are around us. Sometimes we will deny pain exists or we'll distract ourselves with hobbies or we self-medication. We become excessive about what we can control. We overcompensate with maybe an unusually optimistic outlook. We avoid interactions that might cause more pain, what, however we deal with it. Suppressing our emotions, maybe. Maybe it'll just go away if you don't deal with it until it doesn't, and then something snaps. But here's the thing Jesus knew that we would suffer in this life pain. And, and so, in that, he, he actually says these words in Matthew 5. He says this this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because they will be comforted. But here's the question. How? How do we get that comfort that Jesus talks about? Because it seems like sometimes there's not any comfort. It's just more of the same. But it is. It is available to us. See, the early Christians, they evinced worse hardships than we could ever imagine. And the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to many of these people that were suffering. And he writes this letter intending to build up their faith. Because God wants us to have big faith. And Paul writes them as a proclamation of God's 
nature, the very essence of who he is that would encourage them and build their faith. And so in the beginning of this letter we call 2 Corinthians, he says, praise be to the father of compassion. And this is important to know as we work through this. Because as we have discovered, and look, it's not like we didn't already know this, that we've already talked about life can be hard. But it was important to Paul to make sure that the Corinthians knew that God was not just a faraway, distant God that gave us rules, but that he understood us. And not, not that just that he understood us, but in that understanding that he is a father of compassion. Because when he sees us in the pain that our lives can bring, he has compassion. And, and look, he's not only a father of compassion, but also he is the God of all comfort. So he has compassion for us. And he doesn't just feel for us. He also wants to reach out and comfort us, just like a good father would. And it's not just sometimes. Look, it's not just when our troubles are not our fault. Anybody ever been there where the trouble that I need comfort from was caused by me? Like my bad decisions? Maybe it was my mouth that got me in trouble. And even though it was my fault, now that I sit in the trouble that I created, I still need somebody to tell me, you can make it through. Yeah, God is the father of compassion and comfort when sometimes the trouble it did wasn't our fault. But that's not all. It says that he's not only the father of compassion and comfort, but he also comforts us in all our troubles, Amen. not just some of them, because it would make sense that he would comfort, it, comfort us in some of our troubles, you know, the, the troubles that were external, right? The troubles that were beyond our control. It would make sense that he would comfort us in those places, but it doesn't say that he will comfort us in some of our troubles. No, it says he will comfort us in all of our troubles, even those troubles that are self-inflicted. Because I can speak of myself. I mean, am I the only one that have had troubles? And as I'm going through them, I realize that maybe, <laughs> just maybe I brought some of this on myself. Yeah. And yeah, I may have to suffer the consequence of the trouble that I sowed. I may have to pay for my actions. But what's amazing to me, what is comforting to me is to know that even though he, God may make me pay the consequences of my actions, but he's still there in the midst of them. Yeah. And he's there for me to see me through the messes that I made myself. Amen. And look, for those of us that are parents, we all understand this, right? Even when our children need to suffer the consequence of their actions, and by the way, they do. <clears throat> but, and sometimes as parents, we even need to impose those consequences for the good of our children so that they can learn, Right? And even though that we know that this is going to develop their character, we still have compassion for them and even comfort them as they go through the consequences of their actions. And so for us, whether we're the victim of our troubles or the creator of our troubles, the heart, the nature of our Heavenly Father is one of compassion Amen. and comfort. And so we find out that our Heavenly Father is not a mean, aloof, uncaring Father just waiting for us to mess up. So, ah, I told you so. No, He is that compassionate Father, that Father of love that comforts me in all of my troubles, in all the troubles of life. When the troubles of life come, when the, when the pain comes and the heartache comes, we have a Heavenly Father that is compassionate, and caring, and comfort. And so the one thing that I want us to see today is that no matter the trouble that's in our lives, no matter if the trouble is caused by others or if the storm that we are experiencing is because of our own mistakes, the truth is this, that our Father is our comfort in all of our troubles. Our Father is our comfort in the troubles He's our anchor because it's easy to be knocked off center when the, the tide is pounding us from everywhere, right? But if we know that our Father is our anchor, if we know Him as the foundation of our lives, then even when life happens in all, in all its cruelty, we have a Heavenly Father that is our comfort. I have a Heavenly Father that is a Father of compassion and comfort. Because look, we all have places in our lives that we need comfort. Regardless of how strong you are, 
regardless of how independent that you are, how much you've been through, there are moments that we all need comfort. Even Jesus, listen, Jesus had moments when he cried out to his father for comfort. And we're not immune either. You could be grieving a loss in your life, a parent, a spouse, a child. Your compassionate father is your comfort. It could be a loss of a relationship. Maybe a marriage that once seemed so strong, but now it's final. Your father in that moment is your comfort. It could be the pain of your parents fighting in front of you or even breaking up. And they tell you it's all going to be okay, but you know you're going to carry that with you. Your father is your comfort. It could be the pain of words spoken over you, spoken to you. And maybe they're trying to haunt you, even as an adult. And I want you to know your compassionate father is your comfort. It could be, or parents, it could be words spoken to you from your children, and they don't realize that that hurts because you've always been the strong one. But we know those words do hurt. Or maybe it's their actions when they're just thinking about themselves, and so they don't stop to consider how it's affecting you. And they hurt. And we carry that. And in that moment, our Father is our comfort. Look, there's so many ways that trouble finds our heart. There's so many places in our lives that pain and trouble can nest or try to nest. And I think what God is trying to say to us today, to you, to me, is take comfort in me. I am your comfort in the middle of your troubles. And here's what's so cool about what's in God's comfort is there's not just peace in it, but there's healing, there's strength, there's power in his comfort that you are not a victim, right? Because, and here's what I love about God is everything is multifaceting. He's always good to his children. And the reason is, is that it's his nature. It's who he is. And when he's good to his children, he's always got a reason behind the reason. God is the ultimate chess player, right? And here's the thing. He doesn't just comfort us and, and give compassion in all of our troubles, but that's not all. There is a reason. And look, what comes next, it's a little bit of an ask. Because after he is compassionate and comforting, he asks us to do something with it. And look, even though it's an ask, it's not an ask that's hard though, all right? Because it's in our nature to do what he's gonna ask next. It's actually fulfilling. Watch this. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from him. And look, this is not hard because there's something in a healthy human that wants to relieve human suffering in others. Is that right? It's not just about him helping us in our troubles and the pain of our lives, but he wants to empower us. It's so that we can pass it along to others. And we don't mind this. Because it's in our nature. And we get this nature from God himself. He put it in us because he wants us to reflect his nature. He wants you to pass on what you receive. He wants me to pass on what I receive from him. He wants all of his children to reflect his nature to the world around us. The Bible says we have been forgiven. So the expectation is that we will what? We'll forget. It says we've received love and mercy and grace. So he expects me to pour out love to others and mercy to others and grace to others because we all need that. And and that's actually what Jesus did when he came. Watch this. He said, the son, he's speaking of himself. I can do nothing by myself. I can only do what I see my father doing because whatever the father does, the son does as well. So Jesus was actually passing on the nature of his father, and that is one of the reasons that he is our anchor, because he, just like we have to, reflects the nature of his father as a comforter. Even when the shifting tides of life, even when they're painful, it's not just about being comforted, it's about being a conduit of the comfort that we received. And this is key. Because sometimes we miss the obvious. Because part of receiving comfort is an element that we all believe in. We all understand. And that is this, that we reap what we sow. And we all believe this. You get what you, you, know, you, get what you give, right? But we forget this when we need comfort. 
When we need the assurance that, look, everything's going to be all right no matter what happens, we have our anchor in him. And that means everything is going to work out for your good. When we need that assurance and that peace in our lives, where it's more than mental assent, but it's faith, so often we, re- we forget that we reap what we sow. And when we need that comfort and that assurance, we need to look for other people around us that need that assurance, that need that comfort. So Paul tells us, we receive comfort so that we can comfort others. And if we also know that we reap what we sow, it, it's a cycle of comfort that not only heals our wounds, but also it equips us to be healers in a broken world. Now, let me make one thing clear. A lot of people think that if I receive comfort, that means that all my storms disappear. And that's not what I'm saying. Sometimes, but often God's comfort comes in the midst of, com- of trouble. When you study the book of Acts or the lives of the apostles and the early saints, many of our New Testament heroes of the faith, it's undeniable they'd, they'd experienced great storms, great trouble. And God didn't provide them an escape from their trouble, but a peace and a power to endure them. And look, Jesus told his disciples just before his crucifixion, he said, in this world, I'm going to make all your trouble go away. No, you're going to have trouble. Not maybe. It's certain. You're kind of being, you're not being very positive, Micah. No, I'm, being, I'm very positive that Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. But he doesn't leave us there. Here's the thing is the world leaves you there. Life is hard, and they just leave you there. Jesus, your father, your comforter, does not leave there because Jesus said, but don't lose heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. He overcame death, the grave. He overcame every temptation known to man. And by his stripes, we are healed. We were healed. He reigns victorious. And it's in that authority and it's in that power that we take comfort knowing that no matter what comes at us, no matter how large the waves are, he is with us in the midst of it. And he's already overcome it all on our behalf. So going back to Paul's letter, he encourages them. He says, look, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Yes, we're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. All the hardship is there, and all the comfort and the power and the authority is there as well. That's us. This is for us. Why? Because the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, has not left us. He has not abandoned us. He has not left us in a state of despair, but is there to love and guide and nourish us in the midst of the pressure. He's there to comfort us in the middle of of healing and restoration in those broken places in our lives that sometimes may feel hopeless or those situations that feel helpless. He is there to make us steadfast in all of the tide. And you say, Mike, I've suffered a lot. I've never felt this comfort. Sometimes, let me tell you, this comfort, you may not even recognize that it's God at work in the situation if you don't, if you're not open to recognizing and receiving God's comfort and be looking for it. It's like the story of this, the storm that descends on a small town and the downpour soon turns into a flood. And as the waters rise, the local preacher, he kneels on the church porch and prays surrounded by water and eventually one of the townsfolk comes up the street in a canoe better get in preacher the waters are rising fast and the preacher says no no i have faith in the lord he's gonna save me and so the waters rise even more and at, at this point the preacher is up on the balcony praying with another guy he zips up in a motorboat and he says come on preacher We need to get you out of here. It's getting bad. The levee's going to break at any minute. And once again, the preacher, unmoved. I shall remain, he says. The Lord will see me through. And after a while, the levee breaks. The flood rushes over the church, and only the steeple remains above water. And the preacher is up there clinging to the cross. And a helicopter descends out of the clouds. And a state trooper calls down to him through a megaphone and says, Grab the ladder, preacher. we got to get you out of here. This is your last chance. 
And once again, the preacher insists, no, God will deliver me. So then he drowns. <laughs> and when he gets to heaven, he asks God, he said, God, I had unwavering faith in you. Why didn't you deliver me from the flood? And God shakes his head and he says, what did you want from me? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. Sometimes God sends people to help us in our times of pain. And we dismiss the help that they, that they are, that he sends. But it's an opportunity. Sometimes the opportunity is that we have is to sow comfort into other people. That's the opportunity and the help he sends us. But do we talk ourselves out of being used by him because we're so focused on our storms, our troubles? See, when we understand how Jesus stands with us in our pain, and equips us to offer comfort for others, we get to be a source of comfort for somebody else. We get to be God's hands and feet. When we think back, when we think about those times that Jesus provided comfort to us, it, it makes us aware of pain that others in cer- similar circumstances might be going through, and we can be used to provide comfort in those circumstances. Think of a recent time when you felt maybe over, there was a part of your life that was overwhelming. Something was over, unraveling, and maybe somebody offered comfort, took you to dinner, a cup of coffee. Maybe it was just a text saying, I prayed for you. Maybe they provided just time with you. Whatever it was, they were there w- with you and for you in a moment that you needed them. Being used by God, the Father of compassion, to guide and to strengthen and to encourage you in that moment. When we recognize those moments, we can see the instant that Jesus was a source of comfort, even though we may have missed it at the time. We may have missed that that was his presence, his guidance that led to that friend being available to you or to me in that moment. But look, just because we didn't recognize it in that moment doesn't mean that we can't see it now when we look back with hindsight. And now that we're on the other side of that storm, we can see God's hand was at work through that whole thing. And we recognize that comfort and the hope and the joy that came from that. That is when we get excited about being able to provide that same experience for somebody else. So this week, I want to encourage you, reach out to somebody who may need comfort and share your hope that you found in Christ. Remember the comfort that you experienced when somebody reached out to you, when somebody sat with you in your pain or in your grief, or maybe they were just present that presence, that obedience to the Holy Spirit, a lot of times that's just what somebody else needs to experience the same comfort that you felt. That hope is now available to them if we are open and vulnerable enough to just be there with them and know that you're being used by God to share his word, his love, his peace, his comfort, in the lives of somebody else. But here's the thing. It also helps build faith in you because you reap what you sow, remember? Your faith begins to grow from the inside out. You begin to be able to be stronger in the adversity in your own lives when we take our eyes off of ourselves and we support somebody else. By being others-focused, it helps us guard against the temptation of just wallow in our troubles where we can only see the challenges that we face in our own lives. When we focus on helping other people, God can use that as an open door to bring healing to our own lives as well. And look, there's a lot of opportunity all around us right now. This is a a natural condition, pain, trouble, that can only be treated with the Spirit of God and with the comfort of God. As we here in this church as we build strong families and as we make disciple makers, what we do is we walk alongside of them in their troubles when things happen so that they can then help somebody else. As we as a, as a church, as we have the comfort and the peace of God, we also offer those in our community that peace. And when they see us going through the same things that, that the world dishes on everybody else, But when they see we walk through it with power and with authority and with peace because of the comfort and because of the compassion of God, then that that changes everything 
for the world that is watching us in a moment that is very, very unsure, that is full of trouble. Will you stand with me? I just want to pray over you right now.